and we're back really quickly to walk through uh, the Sports Next Door podcast first ever All Star uh, selection for any sport, uh, but we'll be doing this for the NBA and then probably for the NHL once we get closer to that time. Uh, still don't understand why the NBA is doing an All Star game, but. We do have uh, enough data now that we know what some of the early returns are. And of course, we have our own selections. Uh, the All-Star game is typically something where offense is rewarded a little bit more over defense. And in my opinion, I think you should be rewarding guys who contribute to winning. But the All-Star game is something that players get rewarded a little bit more for statistics as opposed to the success of the team and so you might say some differences come out in what we are saying compared to what actually comes out uh when the voting happens yeah it's something i noticed with the nba probably more than almost any sport maybe not so much football but like the, the distinction or the category the tier of all-star means something when they talk about players, they say he's an all-star. Kyle Lowry is a six-time all-star. That like I never hear in the NHL like any player referred to with uh, the category of all-star to like try and distinguish where they are. So it does interest me with the NBA that 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 is kind of a way they separate the top players in the league from the rest with this distinction. So it does, I think, actually seem to matter more than other sports, which makes it that much more important to have a proper selection criteria. Absolutely. And and this year especially, I think it means more because the level of talent in the NBA is probably the deepest it's ever been, ever in the history of the league. Just so many guys, so many top guys, who are just immensely talented and obviously the scoring numbers are on pace to be what we've ever like we've never seen before especially with the pace and space era now with the three-point shooting and all that but it's it really impressive if you are one of the it's basically saying you're one of the best 24 players in the league because they do 12 on each side as opposed to a full nba roster 15 i think in previous years uh, especially in those like 2000s eras where you have you could you have your like top 10 guys and then you have a couple of fringe guys who make it in because story narrative or have just having a solid like basically point season or rebounding season but i think now is like with the number of guys putting up crazy numbers the number of guys with crazy usage rates there's so many guys that are going to be worth like i have eight locks in both conferences and then i've got about 10 guys for the last four spots so you're really you're going to snub someone, so it it does make the All Star classification in itself much more valuable. I would say, especially in the West, because of how much better that conference is and has been for many many years consecutively. Okay, let's get right into it. We will start with the Eastern Conference, and I have my eight locks. Max, you tell me if uh, any of these are not locks for you, but I have Kevin Durant. Giannis Antetokounmpo, Joel Embiid, Bradley Beal, Kyrie Irving, Bam Adebayo, Jason Tatum, and Jalen Brown as my locks. Yeah, the only one I'd struggle with is, uh, we talked about this a bit before the show, but Kyrie Irving, mainly because less games played, I think you, I'd, um, like I said, all-star means something. So if I was going to pick one of the names on that list, it would be the guy who may be all-star on the court, but not acting like an all-star off the court, especially when he is off the court and there is a Nets game going on. But the best way to shut everyone up is just to play the game well. And he's done that pretty well over this last stretch. So I'm uh, not that one I can see being a bit disputable, especially because I'm really impressed that with uh, another Nets player who's in your all-star bubble, James Harden, maybe we can transition right to there. Yeah. Um, the other thing we were talking about the show is the change in his stat line since he moved to the Nets. I'm really impressed with what adjustments he's, I don't know if he's made them or just being on the nets. It's been such a natural unconscious transition, but either way, I love every change in the stat line we've seen. So I, for the high assist numbers, the more consistent showing up on the court, 
I would uh, award James Harden over Kyrie Irving as a all star lock. Yeah. So it, it it comes down to your criteria, right? James Harden has only played eight games in the Eastern Conference, or 14, 14. games. Yes, eight in the West. Is that enough to qualify him to be an Eastern All Star, right? Because it's essentially, you're talking about, I don't know, a guy like CJ McCollum who's injured, who only played 13 games, and he's probably not going to make the team because he hasn't played enough. So do you, it just comes down to do you think James, obviously, he is an all-star and I, it's just unfortunate for him that, or I guess fortunate that he got traded. So you can't, it, it just depends on, has he played enough games for him to qualify? Because if he, de- if you think he has, then he immediately is a lock for the all-star game, but I don't want to reward a guy who uh, lounged around, asked for his way out, then got his way out and hasn't played enough games. Obviously he's an all-star, but I just don't know if I can just award that to him over some of these guys who have played and been such important parts of their team this entire season and played almost every game. But you still have <laughs> as a lock. That's what's cracking me up. Yeah, so that is the other thing. is you, you can use that same argument for Kyrie. The Brooklyn Nets have played 28 games. He's played 19 of them. Uh, he statistically is also a lock. He's averaging 27 and a half points. He's averaging six assists and, and almost five rebounds and shooting 50, 40, 90, which is incredible percentages for him. Uh, yeah. Both of those guys statistically are lock. It's just, what's your cutoff for games played. And if we want to go for a percentage that actually might help us with our conversation moving forward, or we just go on a case by case basis. Yeah. For me, I guess, Maybe I'm setting the bar too low, but there is still something to be said for me for like showing up and doing what's in your contract. And even if Harden's running his mouth off the court, um, making problems in the locker room, like I guess at least he did the bare minimum and showed up and played and didn't like cross his arms and sit on a tent and tantrum line his way out. So I, I guess I'm trying to, it, it is setting the bar so disappointingly low, but I guess at least he played is what I'm okay. trying to say. Um, as for the East versus West, I, I don't, I got to me like an all-star is an all-star. It, it's a distinction in the league, which is difficult with the disparity we've discussed in East versus West. But if you, I don't know that it makes sense to uh, disqualify anyone who moves between the two conferences throughout the season. Okay. Then that puts Harden as our ninth lock. Uh, I believe he's going to get voted in. So in the end, it, it's consistent with what the fans are voting and what media will probably go with. Uh, so that leaves three spots for the following players. Demonis Sabonis, Nikola Vucevic, Julius Randle, Gordon Hayward, Jeremy Grant, Zach Levine, Trey Young, Fred Van Vliet, Chris Middleton, Ben Simmons, and Colin Sexton. Three spots for all of those guys. This is what I'm saying. It's incredibly difficult. The first kind of group of guys I want to talk about are Demonis Sabonis, Nikola Vucevic, and Julius Randle. And they all are kind of varying situations. Sabonis is the most important player on a Indiana Pacers team that sits fourth in the Eastern Conference. Uh, He was an all-star last year. Statistically this year, similar numbers, but the team has struggled a little bit. And with the emergence of Malcolm Brogdon and uh, some production from other pieces on that team, he's fallen kind of into the background again. He had such an incredible start to the season. And I remember shouting him out for Indiana's hot start, but I just, I don't know if his game is flashy enough and if he has done enough to really put himself ahead of some of the other guys on this list. Uh, Nikola Vucevic is basically the only player left on an Orlando magic team that seemingly has been knocked off one by one by a hitman. Uh, and they're all nursing various injuries. Uh, It's basically like they wanted to opt out. They couldn't, so they all went around and banged each other with baseball bats to give themselves excuses, and Vucevic 
missed the memo and arrived and said, oh, I've got Frank Mason and Gary, whatever his last name is, as my <laughs> as my starters. Uh, feel really bad for him, but he's been putting up incredible numbers. I think he should be on the trade market because his salary is manageable for teams and would be a really interesting swap. Uh, I, yeah, it, Vucevic is definitely a guy who uh, has been an All Star a couple years in a row now, and is it comes back to that argument of do you value winning? Do you value production? Or in Vucevic's case, do you value being literally the only guy doing anything on a team? Uh, the last guy in that group of kind of bigs is Julius Randle, who is probably the best player on the Knicks, who are a middling team. They play decent defense. Uh, he had a great start to the season. His numbers have dipped in traditional Julius Randle fashion. Uh, he turns the ball over a ton. He has lowered the turnovers. Uh, the assists are great. He's been playing really well in the post. Um, I just don't know if he's done enough to earn a spot over some of these other guys, but I do think he warrants being in the conversation. So I would say to you, Max, I know you're not super familiar with all these guys. They're all very fringe, but you probably have to pick one out of the three here, uh, Sabonis, Vucevic, and Randall. Yeah, I I fall to the, you give the credit to winning and go with uh, Sabonis. Okay. That seems fair to me. Uh, I I personally probably would side a little bit with Vucevic because this Orlando Magic team actually did start out winning when their team was healthy, minus Jonathan Isaac, but since then have lost uh, Aaron Gordon for a number of games, Cole Anthony for a number of games. Uh, yeah, it's the, the injuries are too – I don't want to walk through the, all the injuries, but um, it's tough for him when he has to do everything by himself and – Orlando's going to really fall out of the playoff picture with the injuries that they have experienced. So it's unfortunate. If I were them, I'd be looking to sell on Aaron Gordon, on Evan Fournier, on Nikola Vucevic uh, to try and get more assets because they do have some some solid young pieces in, in a Cole Anthony and a Jonathan Isaac, uh, in a Chubo Keke. Uh, so this is a team that and, and of course, Markel Fultz. This is a team that has some young guys, and, and if you move Vucevic, you could get a ton of assets, and there are some great prospects in this draft. So maybe that's what you're looking to do as the Orlando Magic. But yeah, I'll go with Sabonis on winning. We just might have to keep that same consistency as we move on to some of these other guys. Well, it it's also about how much of a statistical disparity is there, and how much of that disparity is going to be due to usage rate around talent. So for me, Sabonis and Vucevic are close enough in stats and Sabonis being surrounded by guys like Brogdon, whereas Vucevic being kind of the last man standing, you, you expect Vucevic, you just get a few more touches on the ball. So when the stats are that close, because I will later on the line, maybe in a couple cases, value stats. And one name in particular will come to mind. So I don't know. I'll, I'll uh, caveat it with saying that the points have to be close enough for me to value winning the stats. Okay. We move along. Uh, two guys I wanted to shout out that I think are warranted in the conversation, probably won't get in, are Gordon Hayward for Charlotte. Uh, people were worried about his health. Uh, worried that he could return to the form that he was back in Utah, way back in Utah. Uh, and he's done a great job for Charlotte. He's played really, really well for them. Um, I think this, like, it's a team where you've got contributions from a ton of people, but he's kind of their, their top guy. If you were to pick an all-star, he's averaging 22 points, four assists, five and a half rebounds, playing really well for them. Uh, being a great leader I just don't know if the stats are good enough to be over some of these other guys and and there were so many locks at in the front court that it's tough to slot him in because he is classified as a forward the other guy is Jeremy Grant who uh, wanted the big money to go be the best player on the worst team in the league and he got his wish uh, so good for him 
he's averaging 23 points, three assists, five and a half rebounds. He's getting a ton of touches, uh, doing whatever he wants, playing a ton of minutes for this terrible Detroit Pistons team. It's really bizarre. Uh, I think he's proved that he actually can be a, a solid number one option. I don't know if he would be on a winning team, but it is interesting to see that he has elevated his game immensely uh, because there are a lot of the guys in the league who profiled like a Jeremy Grant, where they'll there be like your three and D quote unquote guys who have more potential, but just never get to show it. And I think he's getting the opportunity to show it and he's actually coming through, which is really cool to see. So I wanted to shout him out, but I think just the fact that his numbers are a lot based on the fact that he's the only guy on the Detroit Pistons team, similar to Vucevic, but with Detroit, it's just simply that their guys are bad. Um, (laughs) So I just don't know if that warrants him a spot over some of these other guys, but I just wanted to shout out Jeremy Grant. Uh, Good work this season, dude. I'm happy that you get your shots up and lose uh, whatever 75% of your games. Okay, so this is this is probably going to be the toughest one we got to get to. Um, we have a ton of guards for for three more spots. Uh, we have Zach Levine, Trey Young, Fred Van Vliet, Chris Middleton, Ben Simmons, and Colin Sexton. And right off the bat, I do actually want to say that I think Chris Middleton should be an all-star. Um, he has been now for a couple years in a row, and, and people really have harped on that fact especially when he has choked in the playoffs the last couple of years. But the dude is fantastic. He's averaging 21, 6, and 6. Uh, he's shooting the lights out of the ball. He's shooting 50, 40, 90 right now. Uh, and is truly like, you could say that Giannis is their best player, but when it comes down to those final two minutes, Chris Middleton is the guy they're giving shots now, especially with Drew Holiday injured. Chris Middleton is the guy who's going to be able to give you a shot. He's that perimeter player uh, in those last two minutes who's going to score the ball for you. And I think that's really, really important for Milwaukee. Uh, Advanced statistic-wise, Chris Middleton is is the nerd's like dream player uh, besides the fact that he shoots mid-range jumpers, but he shoots them at an incredible clip. So, yeah, just, I don't know, shout-out to Chris Middleton. Uh, I actually am going to just throw him in here as an all-star. Because I think the Bucks, as a second place team in the league, deserve two All Stars. We'll get to Philly if they deserve two All Stars because of them being the number one team in the league. But uh, I have Middleton as our tenth All Star. Yeah, I'll add of uh, everyone in the East who is over twenty points per game, Middleton at the lowest field goals attempted. Yeah, he's just a master of efficiency. Really appreciate his work. So that leaves us with, I'm going to remove Colin Sexton. I think he's had a great start to the season. Cleveland has kind of fallen off a cliff recently. He He's a tough kid. He works really hard. He scores the basketball a ton. I just don't know if he contributes to winning enough. And he's basically like a lower version of, of Levine and Trey Young. Basically, he's, he, he's le- on their level scoring-wise, I would say, less efficient but he just doesn't do the other stuff as well as they do, uh, especially Trey Young with the playmaking. So really, we have four guys uh, for two spots, and it comes down to Zach Levine, Trey Young, Fred Van Vliet, and Ben Simmons, two guys who are offensively incredible, and then two guys who give you less offense, but they give you more playmaking, a little bit more playmaking, uh, and a lot more defense. And so that's where our criteria comes in. Trey Young, I think, leading the East in assists. So yeah. I, I'm not sure what who you meant there because the <laughs> defense and the playmaking are uh... <laughs> Yes, I would I would say Zach Levine's playmaking is is lower than Fred Van Bleet's nominally. Uh but yeah, Trey Young, definitely a guy who gets a ton of assists. He also is like, just, <laughs> he touches the ball every possession. The ball doesn't stop going through him. So it's it's tough to evaluate what his point, and we, you could obviously go with like the advanced statistics. But Trey Young right now, I'm sorry, I'm just pulling it up real quick. Yeah, we're both like 
non-stop <laughs> looking. So Trey Young's 11th in the league in usage rate, um, but five of these guys in the top 11 are are like bench players who come in for the last minute of a game. So Trey Young's really top five in the league in usage rate, and that's something that contributes to his assists. Some of the other guys on that list with him are Bradley Beal, Doncic, Embiid, Giannis, and Steph, and Curry's that that sixth guy behind them. And so the assist numbers are great. Uh, he's averaging 9.4 assists per game. But I just, it's, uh, this is the argument. He, he's up the stats from last year, which is why he's probably going to get in. But it was the thing, Beal and him both got snubbed last year from the All-Star game because everyone was saying, you don't play defense and you're the only one who dribbles the basketball on your team. It's you dribble 60 times and then you kick it for a three-pointer. It's it's James Harden esque, but but small por- point guard version. Yeah, yeah. It's if we're talking about All Star as uh, some level of play, then you have to ask about the defense and how important is that going to be. And I mean, Levine, twenty eight points per game is a solid argument. But the team performance right neck and neck with the Hawks, the assist not there, and nominally like the defensive numbers aren't like jumping off to be significant over Trey Young. So that's where I'm at right now, going back and forth between Levine and Young, because I think they're put if stats matter, they're putting up like top five in the East in stats. And each team is kind of in a similar spot. So I feel like one of them gets the spot and I'm going back and forth deliberating between the two. But then you also got to throw in Fred Van Vliet and Ben Simmons. Because if you look at it from a scoring perspective, then Levine and, or even a purely offensive perspective, Levine and Young are the two that get in. However, Fred Van Vliet is one of the best point guards in the league at playing defense above his pay grade he is incredible at getting deflections getting steals harassing guys Uh, he did drop 57 which has to mean something or 54 pardon me Um, and then Ben Simmons uh, is a guy who is probably built the best now to guard LeBron James I don't know if you could really design a better defender and then against Portland the other night is one of the best guys in the league at guarding Damian Lillard. And then you've also got, got him guarding Giannis. And you've also got him guarding Devin Booker or Chris Paul. He's just so incredibly versatile. 6'10", uh, he's strong. I wouldn't say he's reached that strength level of a Giannis or a LeBron yet where he's fully grown into his body because he's still so young. But the lateral quickness at 6'10", and the harassment that he can provide – as a guard defender or just like a ball stopper is incredible. And that value is something that is rarely uh, rewarded for all-star selections, definitely for all NBA, but I, I don't know about all-star selections. Uh, so it, it, it is balancing that intangible stuff in this sense, because Ben Simmons really doesn't produce much on the offensive side of the floor. Uh, he'll rebound well, he'll assist well, he doesn't score a lot. He can't shoot. Uh, which really is, like, will clog things up. So it comes down to what we truly value here out of guys. Because Fred Van Vliet, like, as Raptors fans, were biased. But without he's been their best player this year and been their most present player. Even if he's had some inconsistencies, he's a guy who can drop 54 or he'll hit the most clutch three in a game or he'll make an assist or make a play in the pick and roll or he'll come up with the clutch steal. Like, some of those intangible things – that have meant so much to us this season, it's hard to quantify that and and go up against Levine Utre, who just statistically have blown him out of the water. Yeah, which I, I'm happy to split my picks between the two. So for me, I'm going to say being the number one team in the conference is worth being rewarded. All the defensive intangibles, I, I, I'm big on assists. I just playmaking matters to me. So I'm going to give it to Ben Simmons over Fred Van Fleet, which is mostly giving it to the 76ers six wins being above the Toronto Raptors. And I'm, I'm still, 
I'm still struggling between Levine and Young, but I, I'm leaning Levine just for the well-roundedness in the game to be rewarded, but like, or more, I guess, to punish the <laughs> sheer offensive style of Young. Well, well the, the problem is, is Levine really doesn't have much to stand on in terms of defensive argument. He has no. the body type for it, but he truly doesn't play good defense. And so when you're That's looking said, at it's more about punishing young. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Young might be the worst defensive player in the league. Um, and that's partially no fault of his own, just based on his size. It's really, really hard to play defense at his size. Um, even like a Steph Curry is a little bit taller, a little bit longer can get steals, but like Trey is just so minute. Um, it's really hard in this day and age to, keep himself in front of people on the perimeter and so I don't want to punish him too much for that I would say between him and Levine it comes down to whether you value scoring and like masterful scoring because Levine scores at such a high rate 28 points per game and his effective field goal percentage is one of is up there with bigs which is really uncommon because the bigs like are valued highly in effective field goal percentage because they score around the rim and they score at a high level. And Levine is up there because of he's shooting 43% from three this season, which is incredible. But then Trey Young is just like, he does everything on the offensive side for that Atlanta Hawks team. Like he's their heartbeat. And you could argue because it's James Harden ball because he's the only one who touches it and dribbles it. But I think just the value that he has there for teams uh, setting everyone else up and getting everyone involved that he actually has my nod uh, as an all-star selection as much as it pains me because I really don't like how he doesn't play defense. <laughs> yeah, it's, I I can't come to a satisfying pick between Levine and Young. I, you didn't get, I don't know, maybe you just want to give it to both Van Fleet. Okay, and I so know. I'm, <laughs> so I'm looking right now, Atlanta, is 11 and 15, Chicago's 10 and 15. We'll go Trey Young. Okay. I think that's a good, good, good uh, cap. So our all stars for the East are Kevin Durant, Giannis, Embiid, Beal, Irving, Bam, Tatum, Brown, Harden, Sabonis, Middleton, Simmons, and Trey Young. I'm sorry, Raptors fans. Hey, it, I, I, just give them the break. We're we're actually we're influencing the All Star selection. Do uh, <laughs> make sure none of the Raptors have to participate in that shit show. Exactly. Keep them safe, right? This is the Tampa Bay Raptors this season throwaway uh, in terms of awards and such. They'll be back. Don't worry, Fred will be back next year better than ever. I'm looking forward to it. Tampa Bay, okay. <laughs> Move on to the West. Here are my eight locks for the Western Conference. LeBron James, Nikola Jokic, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Anthony Davis, Steph Curry, Luka Doncic, and Damian Lillard. Hard to argue. Yeah, they they are all so special in what they bring. Um, we actually might, because of AD's injury, I doubt he'll play in the All Star game. So that actually does give us an extra slot to pick a thirteenth as someone who will come to replace him. Okay. So I'll actually. We'll leave give ourselves an out. <laughs> exactly. We'll give ourselves an extra slot. I don't know if it's going to be that easy, but here are the people that I have on my bubble. We have to pick one of from the Pelicans, Zion or Brandon Ingram, or neither. We have Christian Wood. We have, you could pick one or two out of the three guys, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, Mike Conley from the Utah Jazz, or none. John Morant, one of Devin Booker or Chris Paul, or none. De'Aaron Fox, Shea Gilgis Alexander, and DeMar DeRozan. <laughs> That's a ton of guys for five right. spots. Yeah. Um, right off the bat, Zion Williamson. He's really high up in the voting uh, for fan voting. His offensive numbers are through the roof. He's starting to hustle a little bit more. He's starting to get more playmaking. I think he gets in as an all-star uh, based on media and uh, fan voting. I don't think if it comes down to the coaches, I don't know if they vote him in, but uh, this is one where he's a kid that's on the rise and I have no problem voting him in. I think he has outperformed Brandon Ingram in that regard. Uh, 
I don't know how you feel about this. It feels a little bit early to be granting him a status like this, but it's just, he's so like, he's just different. He's just a different kind of player. And it'd be really fun to watch him in the all-star game. I'll say that much. Yeah. I, it is a spectacle above all else. And uh, maybe that's another way to settle the Trey Young dilemma that he's one of those spectacle special players. Uh, and Zion absolutely fits that category. And, you know, he's, he's up there with all those guys we're naming in the stats at a fucking fifth, 60% field goal percentage. So if we're picking from the Pelicans then I'm, We still, there's, I don't know how to settle the winning versus individual performance, but I mean, the Pelicans are an interesting team. The West is, you wish you could almost give the West a couple of spots from the East or something to make this easier because there's truly no easy discrimination to make here. But yeah, Zion, just such a special athlete that you want to see him in there and I think the stats are there to justify it. Sounds good. We'll move along. Uh, I want to talk about Christian Wood. He feels a little bit like the Jeremy Grant of the West, but the Houston Rockets actually are a better team and are playing better defense. Christian Wood doesn't play necessarily great defense, but the step that he's taken forward, he was out of the league. He played in Europe. He played in the G League. His story is incredible. And he's come back, and he's put up 22 points per game, uh, 1.3 assists, but 10 rebounds a game. He's averaging 1.8 turnovers, which is not great, 1.5 blocks. Uh, But just like a guy who is finally getting his opportunity to shine after being a very uh, underrated player on the Detroit Pistons in previous years and is a guy who every year has improved after – digging himself out of the mud uh and now has reached this point where he's in an all-star conversation is just like so fantastic and i'm very happy for him i don't think he gets the nod just because it's he's another one of those guys that's just a high usage rate and that's why his numbers are so high he's a great role player to have i just don't know if he can be the best guy and i don't know if he's there yet in terms of all-star status especially in the western conference I mean, scratch uh, Paul George from our list of locks so far. And every single one of those you can argue is like a generational talent who will like be talked about like throughout the history of basketball. So there's no room to go looking for diamonds of the rough in the rough when the field is already shining so brightly. It's just absurd. Definitely. Okay. We move along to the best team in the league, best record in the league, Utah Jazz, uh, who have now won seven in a row after their one loss, splitting up their two big win streaks. Uh, They crush the Celtics. They uh, come back and and, and beat the Milwaukee Bucks. And the ball movement's incredible. There's a highlight where uh, Royce O'Neal threw a pass way out on the the edge to uh, Bogdanovich, who caught it. And he was getting closed out and he was falling backward. He threw a behind the back pass in the air to the corner for Mitchell, who then uh, got closed out on, whipped across the pass to uh, Joe Ingles, who shot was going to shoot and then found Gobert inside for a dunk. It was just like an incredible, they, they move the ball so incredibly. And their whole team is like one connected string that moves in synchrony and, Gobert is so, so, so important on the defensive end. That's where the, we have to like dig into the criteria again here is his value is unquantifiable on the defensive end, but guys just don't shoot at the rim because he's there. So it's not even like he's getting the block stats. It's more just you don't go in there because he, he is so intimidating. And in terms of screen assists, the nerds go crazy for Rudy Gobert. He's consistently in the top of the league in screen assists because he opens up so much space. Whenever he rolls to the rim, defenses have to collapse. And then you've got all around the arc, 40% three-point shooters that just knock it down. And a lot of that is because of him rolling to the rim. He's been all-star before once. He's been defensive player of the year twice. 
he's a guy that his value is so hard to measure. There are some people talking about him for MVP. I, I wouldn't go that far, but that is just kind of the value. Like it depends on what you value for an all-star game. And uh, then you've got Donovan Mitchell, of course, who's probably their best scorer. And then you've got Mike Conley, who is a guy who's never made an all-star team. He's probably the best player to never make an all-star team. And do we want that to be his legacy? Like there's at some point you kind of have to reward him for the incredible career that he's had. And he hasn't made an all-star team. And this is probably his like biggest renaissance year after he struggled last year in the new system. But now him and Gobert have great chemistry because he's such a talented player. He's been able to figure it out. Uh, the floater's back. He's been shooting great. He's been setting people up. He's injured now, but I, I it's, it's so tough. I between these guys, cause they are the best team in the league who you could honestly not name any of them to the all-star team based on just the spread of production. Yeah. I mean, you, the argument, everything you said just now makes me pretty compelled to go Mitchell and go bear. I, I mean, I'm not gonna consider any year other than this year and trying to pick one and you can make one intangible pick and everything you said about Gobert justifies it. I'd love to see uh, attempts in the paint for teams like their average throughout the season versus attempts in the paint against uh, the jazz on any given night. Maybe that would be a way you could try and measure the impact of Gobert. Uh, Mitchell kind of, like you said, the best scorer on the team and nominally kind of the face of that team in many ways and doing what he's got to do and carrying the load scoring. I mean, players like Clarkson, players like Conley, uh, the ring will be their reward. But when, when we're picking all-stars, I mean, two is stretching it already. So that's where I'm gonna. Okay. Sounds good. We will move on uh, to the comparison of three young point guards who are really taking a step forward this season, Ja Morant, De'Aaron Fox, and Shea Gilgis-Alexander. I don't know if I give the nod to any of them. If any of the three, it would be Morant, just because of how important he is to his team as a whole. I think Fox gets contributions from other guys on his team, and I would say SGA falls victim to a weaker team where he just isn't putting up the statistical numbers that rival some of these other guys. He's definitely scoring the ball at a great rate. Uh, But I would definitely go Morant. Morant has been injured, so it is uh, tough to (laughs) lock him in as one as well. But definitely a group of guys who are around the same level of production and same age and stage of their careers. Um, so I I want to touch on them. I don't know if any of them win the spot, but guys that are definitely in the conversation. The two that I would have for our final two spots here in the West is... The final two being with AD out? Yes, yes. Otherwise, we only have one left. Yeah. Uh, I would go Chris Paul because I think at this stage in the season, he's been more important to what the Suns have done. Uh, He's turned DeAndre Aiden into a great offensive center. Uh, He's turned a lot of those other guys into great offensive players. I think Devin Booker, of course, is going to end up being the most important guy on that team, especially when it comes playoff time. But Booker has had to make an adjustment and get used to this uh, new (laughs) – Suns play style and I think Booker is going to be an all-star as soon as next year and and for many years going forward after that but I think Chris Paul has been more pivotal to what the Suns have been doing uh he can completely controls the pace of their games he turns it on and off when he wants to the assist numbers are fantastic and whenever he wants to he scores or is one of the like most clutch players in the league he's just really really good <laughs> and it's a, another one of those guys who maybe doesn't blow you out of the water stats wise like 17 points eight rebounds but all of those are incredibly meaningful stats 
it's not like a Trey Young where he dribbles 18 times and then he gets doubled and kicks it for an open three. It's like Chris Paul has to weave in and out of the pick and roll, look off a defender and then find an open shooter in the corner uh, or make an incredible pocket pass to DeAndre. And like they just, his stats hold more value and it's hard to quantify that, but I'd go Chris Paul. Any, any, uh, any naysay on that? Oh, <laughs> Hard to argue. I mean, he again, I'd almost lean just if we're going to be giving two spots, give them both to Booker and Paul, which I guess discounts a lot of other players, but reward winning in that crazy deep Western conference. I don't know. It's, it's well, a so tough. That's, that's the last player we have to get to, right? Because if we're going to reward winning, you kind of got to reward the fifth best team in the West, the San Antonio Spurs, whose best player this season has been DeMar DeRozan. Pardon me, the sixth best team in the West. But all those other top teams in the West have their all-star. And San Antonio, who is definitely overperforming so far this season, has gotten maybe DeMar DeRozan's best all-around season he's ever played. He's averaging 20 points, so the scoring's down, but he's averaging seven assists and five rebounds a game, seven assists. Was DeMar ever near that in Toronto? No. And uh, just the stuff that he does for this team is so important. Like down the stretch, he is the most clutch player on their team. He's the guy who gets everyone involved. Uh, A guy who's, again, another guy's hard to quantify his impact, but he's shooting 48% from the field. Uh, he is taking threes, only about two a game, and he's shooting 33%, which is passable and respectable. And yeah, and he's almost 90% from the free throw line. So it's, I just want to give it to DeMar because I think he's impacted winning the most. And I don't know if any of these other guys have an argument that warrants them over him. I don't know if he gets in in the actual voting but I feel like we need to reward him for the way that he's played this season and the step forward that he's taken in his game because he was, what, five-time All-Star in the East until he got traded. So he's been an All-Star before. It's just the Western Conference is is deeper. And I would give him the nod over some of these younger guys who will have a ton of opportunity down the line to make the All-Star team, a Morant, Booker, Fox, SGA. Um, So we don't reward Conley, but I think we should reward DeRozan for the winning uh, and so that's why I have Demar as my All Star in that last spot. I don't know if you want to throw anyone else in there. No, in the it, it it comes down to Booker versus DeRozan for me. If uh, you've had your eyes on Phoenix a lot more than I have, so if you're picking Paul over Booker for them, then uh, yeah, it is it is nice to you want to reward the number one team with maybe a little more. And so that's why we've got a Mitchell and a Gobert, uh, an Embiid and a Simmons, but then going down the ranks, I guess it happy to spread the all-star love a little more. So if, if the dust settles only split it between Paul and DeRozan and snub Booker a little in order to reward San Antonio, having a better season than expected, I, I can live with that. Right. So this is our Western all-stars. LeBron James, Jokic, Kawhi, PG, AD, Steph, Luka, Dame, Zion, Mitchell, Gobert, Paul. And then if Anthony Davis does not play, our replacement is DeMar DeRozan. And again, just LeBron, Jokic, Kawhi, AD, Steph, (laughs) Luka, Dame, Zion. I mean, Zion put in brackets for now. But that first list just... (laughs) Wow. All right. So those are our all-stars. We look forward to hearing the announce coming out later this week. And that wraps up NBA Talk. We'll take a quick break and come back for some talking hockey.